Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our session. My name is Kip, and I'm here today with my incredible colleague, Walk, to share our own trials and tribulations running BERT at scale. Like many of you, about two years ago, we saw game-changing results when we first applied transformer models like BERT to our ML key tasks. As lazy engineers, we immediately scoured the internet for a blog post about how to run this amazing technology in production. To our dismay, we are too bleeding edge. Nobody had done the hard work for us, and Stack Overflow left us hanging. After many arduous months clearing our own path, we were able to deliver amazing impact to our users, and Walk was kind enough to share our learnings for the next lazy engineers. We've received awesome feedback since then from the community about how we've helped them out, as well as heard great suggestions on further improvements for ourselves. Today, I hope we can help many of you out with both this specific challenge, as well as share our general playbook for bridging the gap from paper gains to user impact with ML. So first off, who are we to be schlepping advice? For those without preteens at home, Roblox is a platform to empower imagination. Developers anywhere can create engaging experiences that can be played around the world in moments. In the past few years, we've reached massive scale, the diverse community, creating tens of millions of unique experiences. Messaging is one of our core features, being utilized more than 2 billion times every day. Ensuring the safety of children's messages is one of our core competencies. We want to be among the best in the world at text classification, and recently the BERT architecture has emerged as a key technology in this space. We've spent years optimizing rules and classical models to maintain best-in-class performance, and with our very first attempt with BERT, we saw double-digit improvements in research. Uh, we've earned enough scars, though, to know, uh, to learn not to naively extrapolate lab results into real-world impact. Like many of you, we've made the mistake in our careers of celebrating spreadsheet data science results with executives only to have engineering teams balk when 50,000 lines of IPython notebook code are tossed over the fence. These paper results were so promising that we wanted to be very confident we could deliver the user impact under real-world constraints. We wanted to take the challenge head on. So looking beyond spreadsheet performance, our real concerns were around latency and throughput. For latency, the initial speeds of about one inference per second uh, seem perfectly fine when we are testing on the command line. But we know that in production, we are, lim we are limited to tens of milliseconds to meet our internal SLAs. As for throughput, our experiments benefited from the top of the line hardware entirely focused on a single request. In production, we are handling tens of thousands of requests simultaneously, each arriving independently with its own distinct characteristics. Together, these mean that we can no longer utilize many clever, clever machine learning tricks for instance, batching similarly shaped inputs together, even assuming we could process in batch at all. We are no longer worried about batch latency, but rather the performance of each individual request coming from a user. So what tools did we have at our disposal in this challenge? At Roblox, we are huge fans of NVIDIA GPUs, Intel CPUs, the amazing teams behind both the PyTorch framework and the great folks at Hugging Face uh, with their NLP tool chain. This excellent set of tools lends us great opportunities to hit our goals. So this quickly led us to our first fork in the road. We couldn't imagine deep learning without the bulky GPUs we know and love. But you should have seen the terror on our DevOps team's face when we broached the subject. And they were right. It wasn't just the dollars and cents of using GPUs, which I should mention was very high. The complexity of managing separate hardware for certain workloads and the odds that next year's ML trend would change directions didn't leave us super excited. On the other hand, we are very good at managing gigantic clusters of homogeneous CPU workloads. A decade of experience here has given us not only confidence, but also great contacts at Intel to help us juice every last bit of compute from our hardware. I'm sure you're all familiar with the challenge in this space of picking between state-of-the-art models with an unknown road to production and the allure of rock-solid models, which may leave some recall on the table. Please feel free to weigh in on the chat or in the later discussions on how your team approaches this conundrum. But while this is usually a fun fight between data science and engineering, at Roblox, I am lucky enough to partner with great coworkers like Walk here to help us bridge the gap from soda to shift at Roblox. Thanks, Kip. Um, so many of you might know that there is only one Kip Kaler. Um, but for me, I get the question all the time, like, are you Kwok Lee, you know, the uh, Google brain researcher? Um, so before I get started, I wanted to clear up any and all confusion here. Um, so to start with, I'm Wok N. Lee. That's me there on the left in the picture. And on the right is Kwok V. Lee. Um, and this is a picture of us together at the same place, same time. So we're definitely two different people. And you can see we have two different middle names too. 
Now, I don't need to tell you that Kwok Vili is quite well known. Um, in fact, you might know him as a deep learning researcher who has over 85,000 citations, according to Google Scholar. Um, but as for me, I'm not doing too badly either. Um, in fact, I once got kicked out of a casino um, in Reno for counting cards and blackjack. So there's another differentiator if you need it. Um, number of citations on Google Scholar and or a uh, number of unfair bannings from casinos. So they're all good. So, all right, now that we have that all sorted out, um, I can get into the relatively simpler uh, matter of how to scale BERT on CPU. So from a high level, there was a unifying theme in all of our scaling work, and that was less is more. Um, in other words, we made things faster by making them smaller. And I'm gonna take you through these five examples uh, of doing just this, which ultimately increased our scalability, that's our latency and throughput um, by over 30X. So where we started our journey uh, was just with the vanilla BERT model. Um, and to set the context for you, this was way back in late 2019, uh, before the time of COVID, if you can imagine that. Um, and we had just trained our first BERT models. And uh, while the accuracy was great, um, we had a big problem. Um, it really seemed like the uh, vanilla BERT models just were not very fast or scalable. Um, so in fact, um, if you look inside the pink box there, we were seeing average uh, latencies of about 330 milliseconds um, and uh, awful uh, throughput of under 100 messages per second. And this is on a large 32 core uh, machine. So not very good. So the first really big breakthrough that we had um, was making our model smaller uh, by using something called distill BERT um, instead of BERT. So this literally just means uh, replacing the BERT model uh, with a smaller distill BERT model, the smaller distill BERT model and fine tuning on that instead, um, which is very easy uh, with hugging face, by the way. So we'll talk about the details next, but uh, as our first big breakthrough, we were able to cut our latencies down to 171 milliseconds on average on our benchmark and our throughputs almost doubling up to 185 uh, messages per second. Yeah, so to give you an idea of why we saw this kind of 2x gain um, with the Stillbert, this depiction might help. So the Stillbert is an example of a student model uh, trained from a teacher model using a process called uh, knowledge distillation. So in this case, the teacher model is just the BERT base model, uh, which is has twice the number of transformer layers and almost twice the number of parameters as well. So not coincidentally, um, inferences on distill BERT are twice as fast as BERT, uh, but luckily for us, we only had to sacrifice about 1% of our accuracy as measured in uh, precision recall AUC um, in order to get that. So continuing with the theme of less is more, um, our next big optimization came from smaller inputs. And so what smaller inputs means in this context is avoiding the zero padding of input vectors uh, that we pass into the distill BERT model. So we'll discuss this next, but as you can see, another big uh, improvement here with our uh, average latencies down to 69 milliseconds with this uh, optimization and our throughput um, almost doubling again uh, to 369 messages per second. Okay, wanted to give you a little bit more um, feel for how this uh, smaller inputs works. Uh, so through the BERT tokenization process, um, a sentence is transformed into a numerical vector and we have many examples of that shown here. Um, so in our earlier attempts at optimizing, um, we were trying to batch our inputs um, as shown in the first box here labeled fixed shaped inputs. And because we were batching, we had to zero pad um, uh, our input vectors of different lengths so that they would have the same length and so that we could pass them together um, as a batch into the distilled BERT model. So we thought that batching up these requests was going to be more efficient. Um, but as it turns out, um, it was actually much easier and faster uh, just to use batch sizes of one. Um, and that's what's shown uh, below with dynamic shape inputs. Um, and since we're dealing with, you know, real time request response uh, application here, this was also much more natural. Um, so when we did this, we no longer had to zero pad um, because now the input vectors are all the same length when your batch size is one. 
Um, and so uh, this, yeah, shortened our inputs a lot and we got a big speed uh, improvement that you saw earlier from, from doing this. So our third example of less is more um, we want to share is quantization. And this was actually what provided us with our biggest lift. Um, and it's a, the, the biggest part of why we could achieve a 30X improvement over our BERT burst baseline. So just with these three uh, optimizations you see uh, here on this chart, um, we got all the way down to 10 milliseconds um, of latency on average and over 3000 um, requests per second um, on a 32 core machine. So quantization impro involves improving uh, the efficiency of deep learning computations through smaller representations of model weights, for example, representing 32-bit floating point weights as 8-bit integers. Um, the specific quantization technique we leverage for our Stilbert model is called dynamic quantization. Um, and this technique involves quantizing weights after training, um, as opposed to quantizing during training. Um, and this turns out to be much easier as well. Um, and one of the really cool things about this quantization improvement um, is that in PyTorch, uh, you can do it in just one line. So we're showing here the one-liner to transform select uh, float 32 weights in the Stilbert model into um, uh, into eights uh, so that the at inference time, these smaller weights are, are actually used. Um, one quick note here too, um, this is also a change just like with the Stilbert where we had to give up a little bit of our accuracy um, in order to get uh, the big uh, speed gains. Um, and this is a normal kind of uh, trade-off that you have to think about as you're scaling up your, your model. And uh, here's, yeah, just a very quick peek of what things look like under the hood after you quantize um, your uh, Distilbert model. Um, it is exactly what you'd expect um, from the one-liner, which is uh, the linear layers in the original model are replaced with dynamic quantized linear layers um, in PyTorch, where um, those operations, the underlying operations are done in int8 um, for um, the, uh, in order to get that better performance. Okay, so at this point, we've talked about uh, the three biggest keys to scaling BERT inferences, um, smaller models, smaller inputs, and smaller weights. Uh, but we have two more really important ones to share, and they're also very easy. Um, so the next one uh, isn't rocket science. Uh, we also get a big boost um, in our throughput through simple caching. Um, this is an example uh, of less is more as well, um, because now we're effectively sending a smaller number of requests uh, to our distilled BERT model. And the idea is, if many of your text inputs are the same, you know, there's no reason really to bother your busy deep learning model with responses that it's already calculated. Um, so some of our text classifiers had their throughput increased by uh, over 2x uh, due to caching. Um, and so this is an easy win, but again, it depends on your, the distribution of your text data, um, which is one of the reasons we didn't um, include it in the uh, performance chart. In the last example of less is more, uh, another simple one, and that's thread tuning. Um, so um, this one is so critical that all of the results that you saw earlier are not even possible without doing this uh, on CPU, or at least that was our finding. Um, so the critical thread tuning um, is shown on line, my, line nine above. Um, but the idea is that when you have lots of processes running a BERT model um, on the same machine, uh, which is probably almost always the case when you're running at a high scale like we have, um, you wanna make sure that all those processes play nice with each other um, in, in a CPU setting. So in this case, uh, we did better by limiting uh, thread parallels uh, for each of these processes, in particular limiting each process to just one thread. Um, and to use a foot race analogy, as you can see in the picture below, it's easier for all the runners analogous to processes to finish the race um, if they stick to one lane rather than you know, trying to run in multiple lanes. Um, so this was a really key. And uh, in fact, this is probably where you should start before running any benchmarks um, and, and uh, starting to scale your systems. Okay, so there you have it. Uh, five easy but critical optimizations uh, for scaling BERT inferences on CPU. Um, and putting it all together, um, we got at least a 30x improvement over the BERT baseline. 
um, what you can get out of the box. And we say at least 30X because we're not including the caching gains that we got here either, which would put it well over 30X. Okay, great. So um, that's all we have for you today. Um, there are some key takeaways that, that we'd like to leave you with. Um, so the most important things that we talked about today are first that real-time deep learning applications. Um, for these, it's really feasible and natural um, to absolutely super scale them, uh, the inferences on CPU. Um, and so as Kip mentioned earlier, that was a little bit of a surprise to us, but um, it's very economical. It works really well for a lot of applications. Um, the second big point is that the key to scaling uh, for us was to make things smaller. Um, and we showed you many examples of that in this uh, presentation. Um, third, we'd like to also leave you with uh, the idea that many optimizations um, that enable scale are actually very easy to implement. They're one-liners in a lot of cases. You just have to know about them. Um, and finally, uh, for more details, please check out our blog post. Um, we're leaving a link here. And uh, one more quick final note, um, if you have any questions on this, any suggestions, um, you know, we're always looking to get more performance out of your models. And uh, please reach out, reach out to Kip or myself. Um, and uh, we're always hiring. So uh, we'd be very happy to hear from you. Thank you.